tender whisper of love in the dead of night had you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only. Provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are, you are perfect. You are perfect in all.
cares to us. Amen. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord God, as we contemplate who yes, you Lord. are, you are good, good Father. And Lord, when we think of who you are, it tells us who we are. It tells me who I yes, am. Lord. I am your beloved. And Lord, when I don't even love myself, I know you love me. Because yes, you're a good, good father. God, thank you. God, thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. I have a father. to be praised. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord.
song we could ever sing. We're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. We're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy holy there is no Father, we thank you so much for the privilege you've given us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You alone are worthy of all praise. We want to proclaim to the world how great is our God. Lord, move powerfully in our midst today that we might know you in a deeper and clearer way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Tuesday, we continue our study in the Book of Romans through a Zoom meeting. That's at 7.30. If you'd like to be a part of that, just please let me know. I'll leave your email address and we can set that up. Wednesday, we gather for prayer here at 7 o'clock. Thursday, we'll be here as well for our men's group that we've been having a great, great time. It was canceled this past week because of weather conditions, but we will be looking forward to getting together again. Before you go to the next slide, I uh, just want to express to everyone my heartfelt uh, and deepest appreciation for the expression of love you gave last week. For those who may not have been here last week, um, someone let the secret out that last Sunday was my birthday. <laughs> someone. <laughs> and uh, the expressions of love, the gifts, the cards, the food uh, was just an outpouring. So from the bottom of my heart, next slide, I just want to say thank you to everyone and how much I appreciate each one of you and how much I consider it a, a humbling privilege to be a part of this church and to be here in this capacity. So I just wanted to say thank you. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans, chapter 13. I also want to mention, keep in your prayers, our sister Ruth Apodesano. Um, she's been moved into a, a veteran's uh, nursing facility. It's in Stony Brook. I have the address here with me. Come see me afterwards. She would love a card from you. Um, she was moved there this past week, and according to the uh, stipulations of facilities like that. There's a two-week quarantine before anyone can go see her. Um, but then once that's over, I, I intend to be one of the many who are just going to flood her with uh, seeing her church family, which she misses so much. So I wanted to let you know that. My subject this morning, today I want to talk about a simple word, Voting. I know I announced something more broad last week, but I've been thinking about this all week. This does not make me some great prophet or tremendously profound, but we have many problems in our nations today. Uh, there's division of all kinds. There are economic issues. We have this global pandemic so much social unrest wherever we turn on different, different items. How does a nation truly begin the process of resolving or addressing or trying to solve these issues? If you were to come to me with an issue in your personal life to the extent that your personal life was a mess and in chaos, and needed help, what I would do is sit, we would sit down together, we would open up God's word, and see what the Bible said about moving forward in the particular situation that you were in to move forward from the place you were to a place of victory. We would want God's truth. If you were to come to me with a... a problem in your family and there was a problem in your family and your family was a mess and your family was in chaos and needed help and you said pastor what can we do I would we would sit down together we would open the Bible we would try to look in the Bible to the specific situations that you were dealing with and those that relate to something specifically God said. And we would look to put together a plan and a process that would move forward from the place where you were to a place of victory. Once again, we would want God's truth. If members of this church were to come to me and say, Pastor, we got a mess here. There's chaos and we need help. We would all sit down together, open God's word, 
and look at what the Bible had to say about the particular situation we were dealing with and begin to plot a course, a strategy, a plan from where we were to a place of victory. Because once again, we would want God's truth. Because in other words, as Christians, we believe the Bible has the solution for the deepest issues in our individual lives, in our family lives, in our life as a church. We believe that scripture holds the final and authoritative answers for all of the messes we're dealing with today. We hold to the idea that every issue out there has two answers. God's answer and everybody else's. So we go to God for our personal lives, and we go to God for our family's life, and we go to God for our church life. Yet, where do we often go for answers when we see deep-rooted issues and chaos all around us in our communities and in our nation? Where do we turn when we see moral decay around us? Where do we go when we see social decline in every corner and where do we go when we see economic distress either present or on the horizon where do we turn and sadly so many who believe in the Lord and are called by his name so many turn to other books when it comes to politics when it comes to elections when it comes to social or national issues we turn to other voices they might be family voices. They might be traditional voices. They might be cultural voices. They might be personal preference. But we believe that the Bible informs every area of our life. For many, Scripture is somehow good enough for all the other areas I mentioned. But when it comes to the nation, we, we, we can't go there. But I believe that the same book that can transform an individual, the same book that can transform a family, and the same book that can transform and revise a church can revive a nation because it has the answers we need. We have many needs today. But one of them is not the need to change books. So since the Bible should inform every area of our lives, I wanted to talk today and kind of share how it informs this area of our life. The area that it seems for the past number of weeks, so many in our nation and all over the world are captivated by this one date, November 3rd. I couldn't help but notice and kind of chuckle as I was driving to church this morning and saw one of the various signs for someone running for office. And they said, vote for them for this position on November 6th. <laughs> if you do that, that person is not getting in. I just, it, it, it caught my attention. I wanted to stop the car and take a picture, but I didn't. As I begin to read the scripture passage for this morning in a moment, I want us to keep in mind that when the Apostle Paul wrote this scripture, there were two governing authorities, two principal governing authorities that his readers would have had in the front of their mind this very thing. Render therefore all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Now whatever you think of the governing authorities we have in our nation today at any level, when Paul originally wrote this, he was writing this to people who had in the front of their mind two extremely, extremely evil men, in Augustus Caesar and Julius Caesar. Paul begins this, this section by making it clear that everyone is subject to governing authorities. No government exists apart from God establishing it. We talked about this a lot last week. No authority exists apart from God putting it in place. And while that can mean many different things, which we're going to talk about today, it also means 
You can't talk about government. You can't talk about authority and keep God out of the conversation. But what it doesn't mean is that everyone that serves in government is right. It doesn't mean everyone that serves in government is doing God's work. And it doesn't mean that everyone in government can speak for him. It doesn't mean that everyone is having their foundation for life be informed by the word of God. Sadly, many of them are not. All this says is that the institution, the covenant that's established by a governmental authority was designed and implemented by God to act for good on behalf of people. But to act for good on behalf of people under his authority. Psalm 103, verse 19 reads, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. How many know all means all? His kingdom rules over all. Our God has established earthy governmental authorities, but his throne, his kingdom, still today, as it did when the psalm was written, rules over all. He determines these things. So any leader that wants to get puffed up because they believe they've been chosen by God to be in a particular position, God still rules over all. In the book of Daniel, chapter 4, as Daniel was trying to help King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, in interpreting a dream, this decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. We need to understand that when God puts someone in a position of leadership, it's because God said so. God is the one who gets the glory. God is the one who is the determining factor. Most people will say to to me, well, I can see why God put you in the leadership position. You speak well, and and you can sing, and and you can interpret the scriptures, and this and that. Those things all may be true, and I try to improve in every area that was mentioned, but the only reason I'm here is because God said so. Not because of any ability I possess. Here, Daniel is interpreting a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, where God is trying to bring down what was in that part of the book of Daniel, a pompous, prideful, arrogant and self-centered king we don't know anything about that today trying to remind him that God rules in the realm of humankind and no one no one is above that in his sovereignty God has allowed individuals to serve as leaders in these various governmental systems ours is a democratic republic in England they've got a parliamentary republic with a monarchy God is still in charge of it all, and he rules over it all. And some of the systems have been good, and some of them, not so much. But we need to understand this thing that God has given you and me. God never forces obedience to his rule. He looks at you and says, you have a choice to make. Each person is given the freedom to obey him, which means the flip side of that coin is every person is given the freedom to disobey. But with this freedom, what we get to do is control the choice. However, what we don't get to do with our freedom is control the consequences that come with that choice. God's promise, God's promise is to bless a nation that recognizes him. Psalm 33, verse number 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Throughout the scriptures, the closer a nation chooses to be to God, there will be consequences in keeping with that positive choice. Conversely, the further away a nation chooses to be from God, There are consequences in keeping with that choice. And one of the primary intended consequences of a properly functioning government is freedom. You get to choose. Now, 
people have a different definition of freedom. People, I've heard so many people say freedom means I can do whatever I want. That's not, to me, freedom. That's chaos. That, that's chaos. Freedom is the, is the ability to freely act responsibly so that you can become all that God created you to be. The freedom that our government or any government on this planet needs to promote is the expanding of good as defined by God and the limiting of evil as defined by God. When it comes to this question of voting, oftentimes, and I'm sure many of you have heard it, it often gets put in one particular context. Whose side are you on? As for Christians, we try to and determine oftentimes whose side God is on. And I mentioned this last week. He's on his own side. In the book of Joshua, chapter 5, Joshua is getting ready for a very famous battle, the Battle of Jericho. And he's prepared and he's gotten his army together and he's gathered his forces and they've put out a strategy and they're going to take the city of Jericho. And just as he's about to move into position to get going with the battle, he sees another army approaching. This other army came out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, there's this army there. And Joshua d does the only sensible thing. He tries to find out, okay, are you for me? Or are you for my enemy? Do I have one problem or two problems? Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse number 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood beside him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth in worship and said, What does the Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandal from your foot, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua wanted to know, Are you for me or are you for my adversaries? Do I have one Opponent, or do I have two? And the man said to him, I'm not for you, and I'm not for your opponent. I am not the commander of your army, and I'm not the commander of the army in Jericho. I am the commander of the Lord's army. So it's not for me to decide if I'm on your side. It's for you to decide if you're on our side. He was not on Joshua's side. He was not on Jericho's side. The question Joshua asked of him is one Joshua needed to answer. Whose side was Joshua on? If Joshua was on the Lord's side, that would benefit him, particularly in this case. As if you read further in Joshua, the battle of Jericho did go Joshua's way. But in a very different story, three chapters later in Joshua chapter 8, the battle didn't go Joshua's way in the battle of Ai. And what we need to understand and what it just seems to me, not just our world in general or our nation in general, but the body of Christ specifically, is that sometimes God's agenda is best served by being here or by being there. The notion that any particular group or any particular platform or any particular party has dibs on God's side is just ridiculous. No one has exclusive rights to God's agenda. But this goes beyond agenda or political talking points. What side are you on, Pastor? I want to be on God's side. I want him to inform me. I want him to direct me. I want him to move in my life. And that might mean one thing one year and one thing the next. God has me in a nation that allows me the privilege to vote in annual elections. And my citizen's responsibility is I need to go vote. But as I tried to make it clear last week, and forgive me if I was vague or confusing, 
But while I am thrilled and proud and honored that the, my passport says United States of America, ultimately I am the citizen of another kingdom. And there are many brothers and sisters who join me in being citizens of that very same kingdom. And they also have the right to vote. They believe in Jesus as Lord. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe that Jesus died for our sins. They believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the, the, dead on the third day. They believe that he today is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And they believe that he will return one day. And sometimes I believe, I hope he comes before November 3rd. You all believe the same things, and yet they're going to go into the voting booth if they haven't gone on and done it already and vote in a very different way than I did. So for me, if you're my brother, if you're my sister in Christ, you can look at politics differently than I do. You can vote differently than I do. You can support different causes than I do. You can align yourself at times with different groups than I do, but there's one thing you can't do. There's one thing you can't be, is you can't be my enemy. You can't be my adversary because you're my family. And the determining factor as to whether or not you and I are family is not how you vote. Now, I need to share some thoughts about why I went here. Last week, I did church and state, and today, just a simple topic on voting. And I've shared this in many messages before the last couple of weeks. It's sad when I see the division that's around our nation today. It's sad when I see the racial division, the, the gender division, the, the ideological division. It's very sad. But ultimately, what to me is even graver is the division that I see in the body of Christ. Because we're citizens of a different kingdom. When we get to heaven one day, there's not going to be a red side and a blue side. There's not going to be a side of heaven where they ride donkeys and a side of heaven where they ride elephants. You get the picture I was trying to paint there. Thank you. I was at a minister's conference yesterday in Central Islip. And I was sharing and, and listening to some of my brothers and sisters who pastor churches in the five boroughs of New York City. They pastor wonderful churches, uh, churches I've ministered, been ministered to, or I've, ministered, I've been ministered by them, and I've been privileged to preach in their churches. And I know for a fact, because of having been around them for a long period of time and seeing how they engage in social media, that we hold some very different ideas about a lot of things. But when we were together yesterday, they were my brothers. They were my sisters. They were my family. And this idea that if you go right or you go left, I can't be with you, that is not a Christian principle. We need to be one in Jesus. We need to be one in the Lord. We need to come together as God's people, especially at a time when our nation is completely incapable of figuring out how unity works. When we have an answer that says unity works in Christ. All my entire adult Christian life, and definitely my ministry, I've been drawn to organizations that bring the body of Christ together. I've been part of a retreat community on Long Island called Tristias. And it basically focuses on conducting retreats where people come from all different kind of churches just to experience the love of God. And because of that, I've been able to minister in some of their churches. 
I've preached in all kinds of places. I've preached in Presbyterian churches. I've preached in Methodist churches. I've preached in Baptist churches. I even once preached in the Catholic church. Only once. I was only invited once. In each place, what did I do? I preached the gospel. I preached the love of Jesus. And I preached that it is justification by faith alone in the sacrifice and in the blood of Jesus that we're going to celebrate in communion in a few moments. Now, are there other differences between my family and those churches? You bet. But we decided for a moment that we were just going to be family. Let me ask you, and maybe it's just me. Do any of you have family that disagree with you? Which is just me. Different question. Do any of you possibly have family that annoy you? Hmm. Again, it could be just me. And do any of you have family that if they were sitting here and hearing those questions, would be thinking of you? <laughs> And yet, we're going to be entering a season shortly where we still are family. It needs to be that way in the body of Christ. Now, I will stand up for our distinctiveness. I will stand up for our principles as a Pentecostal church. But I am part of something bigger. Something amazing called the body of Jesus Christ. And there is power in unity. So even though my fellow Church of God ministers who were there yesterday and they've got different perspective on a lot of different things, we came together and we prayed one for another. And we genuinely asked, how are you doing? How's your family? How are your children? Asking each other even pointed questions. How's your health? How's your marriage? How are things going? Caring one for another, even though I know on some of these issues, we differ. When I've gotten together with the trustees community or other parachurch organizations, they're called. The same questions. How are you? Let's pray. Let's pray to the same Jesus that he would move in your life as he's moved in mine. You know, the Bible does not say, resist the Baptists and they will flee. It doesn't say that. I've read the verse. It doesn't say that. It says, resist the devil and he will flee. You're my friends. You're my brothers and sisters. Now, by sharing this aspect of my heart, I may have completely made you angry at me. And if I have, I'm sorry about that. But at least you know more about me than you did before. And at least you know that no matter how angry you get, ever get at me, you'll still be my brother or my sister. Face it, church, we're stuck with each other. <laughs> For all eternity. We're family. All the different pictures and scenes that will begin to flood all of our viewing opportunities as we now get into November and into December will be images of family. All of a sudden, the painter Norman Rockwell, who's been completely ignored for the last 10 months of our year, will become front and center for everything as his picture is about family. And I love my family. I love my immediate family. I love my extended family. I look forward to seeing them when we can get together once or twice a year. And then usually after the once or twice a year, I understand why we get together once or twice a year. But when it comes to my brothers and sisters in Christ, I need you. 
I need you in my life. We need to be family to each other. When Jesus was with his disciples at the Last Supper and then broke off with a much smaller subgroup to pray as he entered the Garden of Gethsemane, he wanted people with him. That's why the comment is so telling when he comes out of the garden and asks, couldn't you pray with me one hour? He wasn't judging their prayer life. He was asking for something personal. That's what we need for each other, to be family. So November 3rd will come. The ads will be there. We'll see after that if any of the predictions of national civil unrest are true. But one thing I know is true about November 4th is the same thing that was true about November 2nd. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. And nothing that happens in the world is going to change that. Jesus came to provide a sacrifice. He bled and died on Calvary. He suffered torture for you and me so that you and I could share together with each other in a relationship that's only possible as we come close to God. Amen. To me, when I look at the word communion, I see two words, come, union. This really isn't rocket science. This is the body of Christ coming together to share the Lord's table. And I've shared, I've been privileged to share the Lord's table in seven different countries and in many unique ways. Today, we will be sharing it the way we normally do. There will be no berry leaves for the body of Christ. There will be no Honduran coffee for the blood of Christ. It would be a much more livelier service if we poured Honduran coffee for everybody. But we come together. This is my heart. This is what I'm about. And this is what we need to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the people in front of me. They're my family. Sure, we can rub each other the wrong way sometimes, and we can get on each other's nerves sometimes, and we can upset one another sometimes. But Lord, we're one in you. We're one in you. I ask you to bless the body of Christ in this nation, that we would be an example to the world, an example to America of what unity looks like, that we do not require unanimity being the same on every single thought and every single word and every single trait, but we can with our differences, with our unique distinctiveness, be one in you, a unity that brings power and that changes lives. Lord, we come today to remember the sacrifice you made so that we could be one. We come together to remember the pain you went through so that we could be family in you. We come together to celebrate the power you displayed in rising from the dead that gives us the power to rise above our differences. Lord, help us. Yes, it is true that America needs you. But Lord, I start first with the American church needs you. We need you, Lord. The Bible says we should focus and take a moment and examine ourselves before approaching his table. Talk to God in your own special way right now, but 
just examine your own heart as we prepare for communion. The Bible says on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat the bread together. The scriptures later tell us that on the, that same night when the meal had ended, he took a cup and said, this is my blood which is shed for you. This is the new covenant, a covenant based on the grace I extend to each of you in the hopes you extend that grace to one another. Let's drink the cup together. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, that all would see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Lord, you are great. Stand with me, please. Well, I sense when we walked in here, we were friends. Hopefully, we still are. <laughs> we're family. We're even more than friends. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. That's our prayer, Lord, that it would be a sweet sound in your ear. Father, we praise you here. We give you glory and honor because you're the only one worthy of praise. We give you glory and honor because you're the only one worthy of the loyalty and allegiance that we give. Lord, help us to be shining examples of your love. Help us to be shining examples of your care in a time that is so divisive, so unloving, and where all around us, it seems things are so careless. Move in our lives. Help us to be your hands. Help us to be your voice. Help us to be your people. We praise you. We thank you. And we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said.